Great. So our final presentation today reveals some interesting findings in a recent uh, research study that uh, Medill and Deloitte did on B2B marketing strategies. This really is a great opportunity because it's an exclusive preview of a long-range study that will be extremely useful to our industry. So please join me in welcoming Tom Collinger and Jonathan Kopolsky. Thank you. Okay. Let's see. Okay. We're almost done. So, uh, show of hands, how many of you remember seeing Young Frankenstein by Mel Brooks? That's perfect. So, you'll remember that when Gene Wilder got his way off the train in Transylvania and he's met by Igor, played by Marty Feldman, uh, he looks at Marty Feldman, the hunchback, and he says, you know, I'm a doctor, I can fix that hump. And of course, his answer was, it's a great audience. <laughs> That's a great audience. Of course, they, they, uh, they gave it away when they showed it earlier. Now I've got to figure out which button it is here. Nope, that's not it. And that's not it. Okay. Oh, well, this is it. That's it. That's it. Okay, so that was the, you saw the what hump. Okay. All right, so um, we're going to walk through four uh, parts of this conversation. First, I'm going to share uh, the results of a survey that we ran, thanks to those of you that are here that happen to have responded to it, to uh, share what it is that you believe is important to your clients. We're going to talk to you about, actually Jonathan's going to share the way it is that Deloitte has been going about it. The research that we did uh, at the Spiegel Research Center, thanks to working with Deloitte and getting access to practically, not all, but practically all of their uh, customer engagement behaviors from all of their activities as well as their sales opportunity to link and map the relationship between those two and then uh, finish with uh, some thoughts about impact to you. So what's important to your clients? So here's the answer to the question, uh, do you think the role of a salesperson or account manager in generating business is important? You believe your clients think that that's almost, almost an eight. Uh, not shocking. Uh, awareness of the company's presence in the industry and generating business results, less important, but still important. The company's reputation in generating business results, the highest. So having a great reputation, you believe, your clients believe, is the most important thing. Uh, the importance of producing valuable thought-leading content to their clients and prospects. Maybe it's a biased audience, but 7.2. Uh, the relative importance of advertising, uh, not so much, 5.4. And finally, participating in trade shows and events, 8.14. So uh, one other data point on this particular question was, note that the question about the importance of producing valuable thought leading content had a 7.2, but it also had a minimum of somebody who said that the client had absolutely no uh, uh, belief in it and others who said it was the most important thing. So just a curious sort of um, range and diversity of uh, responses from this audience. Uh, the second question was, considering how your clients think about their investments in marketing, advertising, and B2B communication and their influence on the bottom line. It's a vital driver to business success. You believe that they believe that's about a six. It's necessary, a 7.2. I'm not wholly convinced of its importance. Less, that's, that's better. We do it because competition does it, 5.1. And I don't believe it drives business results only two and a half maybe self-serving. So let me just stop and ask you, is there anything that I've just shared that's at all surprising? Or does it just confirm what all of you would think? Any, anybody surprised by any of this? Nobody surprised by it. Okay. Let me move on. So uh, I'm going to turn it over to Jonathan, who's going to share with you what it is that uh, Deloitte has been doing when it comes to driving um, connection. Yeah, that one, the green one. Connection with their clients. Okay, so good afternoon. 
thanks to all of you who have stuck in with this for the whole day. So um, just to explain it, so I have been the CMO at Deloitte for our consulting business. How many of you have not heard of Deloitte? Okay, good. <laughs> so uh, just to put it in parameters, we're about a $35 billion business globally. We're about $18 billion in the US. Our consulting business is roughly about $8 billion. So we're a pretty big business. But, and, and if you think about Deloitte, we have a problem that most businesses would envy. If you look at awareness, unaided and aided awareness, we are off the charts. People know Deloitte, we have a great reputation for being trustworthy, for being a wonderful brand, and so forth. So that's the problem that we have because when you ask people what they know about Deloitte, they tend to know our tax and our auto business. And if you talk to any of my colleagues and say, what's the typical response that you get when you tell people you work for Deloitte is, are you a CPA? And the reality is that audit and tax were a hundred year old business. That is what got us to where we are today, but that is not the business that's gonna propel us in the future. It's gonna be our consulting and advisory business. And that already represents more than half of our business and it's the fastest growing. So we've got a very good base with our audit and tax business, but what we wanna grow is our consulting and advisory business. So that's one issue that we have. The second issue that we have is people recognize the name Deloitte, but they recognize the name PwC, they recognize the name AW, and they recognize the name KPMG. So we belong to this iconic category called the Big Four. And often I'll talk to people and they'll talk about particular incident, news, whatever, or we've used Deloitte, and what they really meant is they use PwC or KPMG or EY. So how we break out of that iconic category is a challenge to us because once again, the businesses that will propel us in the future are not the businesses that got us here. And if you look, one of the big investments we made, we just made an announcement yesterday, is in our digital marketing capabilities. We have a business called Deloitte Digital, which is a $3 billion business that competes with WPP, competes with Omnicom, competes with IPG. And that's what we want to grow in the future. And then the last problem is where we believe that the opportunities are for us as a consulting and advisory business is really about helping people with innovation, disruptive technologies, and so forth. And once again, that's not stuff that people know when they associate with Deloitte. Now, it's pretty amazing to have an $8 billion business that people don't know about. And that's a good challenge for us to have. So about Three years ago, we really said, what can we do about it? And we made a couple of tactical decisions. One was that we decided to invest more in marketing. So if you went and looked at our marketing budgets and our communication budget three or four years ago, they were anemic. They're still small, but they're a lot bigger than they were three or four years ago. The second thing that we did was that we built a content generation engine. So if you go to our website, you'll see Deloitte.com, but you'll also see something called Deloitte University Press. Deloitte University Press is a publishing house that we run at Deloitte, which publishes not just white papers and so forth, but we have massive open online courses, we've had podcasts, we have uh, videos, we have interactive graphics. We have more than a million people who come to visit our Deloitte University Press website every year. More than a million people. We've invested heavily in digital and digital technologies. You can go to see a um, joint venture that we did with the MIT Media Lab called Data USA. It's the largest single interactive large scale visualization of data, federal government data in the world. And we've worked with um, all open source data from the federal government to answer questions like, what's the fastest growing occupation in your zip code? or what's the health status of people in your zip code. And that was all part of investment we made to build that reputation around innovation. We've created a series of immersive experiences. If somebody in our client takes a job as a CFO, we do a CFO transition lab. And that lab is focused on helping them to become a better CFO. And we spend two days with them, and in the course of two days, we learn about all the issues that they're concerned about becoming a CFO. Builds incredible amounts of trust but it's an immersive experience which then builds a relationship with us that transcends into revenue growth. And the last thing we've done is we've really invested very heavily in what we call our crown jewel clients. So these are the 160 global clients which represent about 60% of our revenues globally. 
And what we're trying to do is figure out better ways to interact with those clients, engage those clients, and drive our revenues in those clients. So these would be the household names that you're all familiar with, the General Electrics of the world, the General Motors of the world, Samsung's of the world, the Apple's, and so forth, which are where we're really betting our future. So reaching millions of people is nice, but reaching the millions of people who work for those 160 companies is what's really important to us. So what we're trying to do is to build a reputation, not for who we were, build off of that, but build a reputation for what's next. And what's next is a digital innovation, disruptive technology company that can help our clients to be successful. So we did, for the first time, television advertising last summer in conjunction with a new sponsorship with the United States Golf Association, and it's called Look Again. I encourage you to go just search for Look Again Deloitte. You can see the ads. This happens to feature lemons, and it's meant to be a double entendre. One is that we help our clients look again, look around the corner, see opportunities and possibilities that they didn't imagine, and they should look again at us. And it's been incredibly successful in terms of recognition, in terms of the internal engagement of our people around those ads, but also in terms of people saying, I saw your ads, those were great ads. Now the issue that we're at, and this is why we start to interact with Spiegel, I've been on the advisory board for Spiegel Research Center since its inception, and Tom and I have known each other for a number of years, is all good stuff. We've got great brand, we're building awareness for these other businesses, but how do we use analytics to help us to figure out the stuff we could do? Because there's no shortage of opportunities, whether it's advertising, whether it's content creation, and so forth, which stuff really matters with our clients, and how do we develop an analytical framework which is gonna help us to understand it? And the big issue that we've had is we've tended to do sort of single line of sight attribution. Did they come to the seminar and did they buy a piece of business? And the reality is that's not how we sell a business. It's all about relationships. So it's how do we take a relationship which may be $50 million and turn it into $100 million. And it's a complex set of engagement activities that clients interact with us that's gonna drive that. So you know, trying to say they saw this ad, they bought a $10 million project, highly unlikely that's not the way our world works. The other thing is we're B2B, we go through our sales force, which in our, our case, our client service partners like myself and my colleagues, and that's really about taking opportunities and turning those into sales. So with that, I'll turn it back to Tom, who will talk a bit about what we spent now. We had our first conversation a year ago, mm -hmm. saying, what can we do with all this data that we have? Mm -hmm. Literally, you know, millions of interactions that we've had with our clients, and figure out what it all means. Thank you. So uh, unlike um, Marty Feldman, uh, we had a, uh, a partner here who knew that he had a hump, and the hump was how do we really better understand what it is that the data was gonna be able to tell us to inform our activities. So I, uh, I look forward to sharing this. So when we started, we basically had a number of hypotheses. Can we prove that engagement with marketing communications, with content, with events, actually drives outcomes? Can we prove it? If so, by how much? If so, which ones? On what topics? To which companies, industries, and job functions? So the way we went through it was, this is a high level sort of mapping of how we attack the data. So on the far left you see, we first we had to isolate the data that came out of, out of what we're calling brand action. Those are all of the activities all of the activities that we just talked about from the website to events across all of them. And uh, all of those, you know, uh, tiny little details. It wasn't just ev events versus uh, digital. It was which event, at what time, and it was over a long period of time, years. Next, we identified the engagement data, which we call the uh, brand dialogue behaviors. So not just w did we do it, excuse me, did the uh, company run the activity, but was there engagement? Did the client go to the website? Did they go to the event? So we looked at uh, attendance in, across all of those activities. Then we also had the opportunity to look at sales opportunities as identified as requests for proposals to Deloitte. So we know the relationship, they know the relationship between sales opportunities and revenue. 
So all we needed to do is to see whether or not, in fact, there is a relationship between all of those client engagements and sales opportunities. So here's the punchline. The punchline is that engagement rates in marketing activities drive sales opportunities. And not only that, but you can see that the top bar, 3,240, which turned out to be a strangely magical number of activities, excuse me, of engagements. This represents activities by all of those, as Jonathan said, those millions of employees at those large companies. The number of engagements over the period of time in which we observe that, those who engage those companies, because we were able to identify individuals across companies, those companies that had more than 3,200 engagements had 40 subsequent sales opportunities. Those who had less than that, eight. Not surprisingly, digital and website visit behavior also more, more narrowly, if we take out events, has significant impact as well. This chart is a way of just demonstrating the tremendous range and diversity of engagement behaviors. So you've got a, you know, a, a tremendous curve here of those uh, that kind of represent the 80-20 rule. <clears throat> Excuse me. And this represents total visits on uh, Deloitte.com and DU Press over a three year period. And we've also narrowed it down, this is by way of illustration, just to show that we could also identify very specific activities, again, looking at how those engagement behaviors laid out across the number of attendees and accounts. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, this, this scatter plot is really just designed to share that, not maybe not surprisingly, that there's tremendous range and diversity of types of engagement by clients. And that, of course, is perhaps the headline on this whole story, is that individual clients behave differently by activity and by topic. <clears throat> Excuse me. It actually supports what it is that you just heard in the uh, prior conversation. In the upper left-hand corner, that's a, an individual account that happens to attend a lot of webcasts, but no Deloitte events. And on the bottom right circle, you see an account that attended events, very few webcasts. We also found that you would know this very well as publishers, that topic relevance also has significant influence. So what you see is you've got content themes and you've got the various ways in which they engage. And what you find is that, not surprisingly, between the, you see pluses and minuses, we actually have the actual numbers, but pluses and minuses where topics have greater or lesser relevance based upon the particular cat uh, vertical and industry that they've got. Probably no surprise, but when you are pushing out content broadly, this is a uh, confirmation that, of course, the more uh, relevant it is to that particular industry, the more engagement. Uh, maybe this wouldn't surprise you either, but we confirm that, in fact, that engagement also actually differs by the length of time in which Deloitte has been doing business with clients. It feeds what probably is generally understood that good clients stay good clients and good clients tend to engage more. Now I'm not going to go through this this uh, tree chart but I just want to sort of show you what basically is the model and what you see here is and it's color coded but what you see here is you've got web visits, you've got the various variables that I've just highlighted uh, web visits and engagement, client year, debriefs, industries, all of those variables were uh, analyzed in the model. And what you see at the very top is that there's a split at this strangely magical number of engagements, 3,240. And on the right side of the chart at the very top, 
it shows you an N of 167 out of the 1,000 uh, accounts, and you'll see that they had a, a uh, sales opportunity of 40. And on the far left, you'll notice that the web visits and engagements of less than 3,200, sales opportunity of eight. So what does all that mean? How do you turn that into something that actually is operational? So we're talking now about building and integrating client-centric industries. Deloitte does a wonderful job, not surprisingly, of understanding what programs, what campaigns, what marketing activities drive uh, and engagement. They had that data, but they hadn't been able to look at it on a client by client basis. So the idea here is actually to create a client engagement index, not a campaign index. A client digital engagement index, an engagement interest rate, which of course is conversion, a topic relevance index, and a topic engagement rate, all tools as part of a dashboard to enable them to see in a very different way than the way they typically have how well client A is engaging and perhaps be able to use that engagement as a canary in the coal mine because in fact the analysis that we did mapped engagement in, in year one, metaphorically year one, and sales opportunity in year two. So the ability to actually see trend changes both up and down in engagement provides them an opportunity to see how are we doing. They have a diagnostic that they didn't have before. Um, I'm not going to walk you through this in detail, but it just demonstrates the way in which these industries could actually, excuse me, indices, not industries, indices could actually be reflected. So this actually is one client and you'll see that in this one client over these four years, we're able to map out all of the engagements for that one client and develop a digital and client engagement index, giving them the ability to see velocity, changes, trends, as well as relative levels of engagement compared to others in their industry. Same thing with the topic relevance index, the ability to see which are the topics that this particular client, this particular client found most, most relevant. Uh, as it turns out, we found some uh, perhaps surprises in looking at the topic relevance area, which is to say that some of the things that were of greatest interest in terms of campaign responsiveness were not necessarily the things that were of greatest interest within certain categories. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, a challenge, but it certainly points to the opportunities in the last presentation for much more uh, narrow cast uh, messaging if you know what it is that those clients are most interested in. And finally, this topic engagement rate. This is a conversion uh, of the extent to which they engage and convert. So what does this all mean to you? Um, by the way, that's Marty Feldman as a younger man. So the idea that uh, you're changing is, uh, not, is not newsworthy. It, the hope today in our talk was to advise you that your clients are changing too. Uh, Deloitte probably doesn't represent an exemplar of all of your clients for all kinds of reasons. But the fact that they've done the kinds of investments that they have in content development, in thought leadership, in the ability to work with us in better understanding the relationship between clients' engagement and sales opportunity, <clears throat> it's important to know. So what do you do with that, particularly with these more sophisticated clients? Well, aligning your clients' metrics and dashboards with your work. So the extent to which you can be inside the tent working with your clients to better understand what it is that they know, the more precise your ability to be their partner. Um, the third point is to suggest mastering the topics that engage, not just 
for the broadest audiences, but in the case of a company like Deloitte, for which of those uh, industries, which of those verticals actually are the ones that are different and what kinds of topics are of greatest interest to them. And finally, to help your clients fuel their engagement index. Now, they may or may not know the relationship between their customers' engagement with their, the various media and the various activities and the various events, but help them do that. And uh, hopefully in, in doing that, you'd be a better partner. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Well, thank you. And uh, that concludes our, our program this afternoon. Uh, thank you all for staying uh, till the end. I, I know it's been a, a, a information-packed day. And with that, uh, the bar is open. So thank you.